Hello again and welcome to this, the second in our series of podcasts talking to farming and agri-stakeholders about the impact of AFBI on agriculture in Northern Ireland. The series showcases how cutting-edge research enables the local agri-food industry to market products nationally and internationally, helps protect animal and plant health, ensures the safety of the food we eat, guards our land and sea environments and is critical to our economic and environmental sustainability. In these changing times, AFBI Impacts gives you the inside track. Today we're going to explore bovine TB with Adrian Allen, lead for TB research in Northern Ireland in AFBI. Thanks for coming along, Adrian. Good to see you. And I suppose for anyone not familiar with the disease, Adrian, bovine TB, as you know, causes suffering and distress not only to affected animals, but the farmers who care for them and whose livelihoods depend on healthy stock. Statistics published by DERA for May 2023 show herd incidence for bovine TB has reached a new record high here of 10.84%. In 2022, when the incidence in the cattle population was 9.95%, more than 16,000 cattle were slaughtered. For taxpayers too, TB is a huge financial burden. The bill to carry out on-farm testing and pay compensation for animals slaughtered after a positive result has now topped, would you believe, £50 million. So how did we get to this point? And how are we going to turn the tide on TB? What do you think? When you hear that the incidence of TB has reached that record high after all of these years of testing. I think if you go back, kind of a, a historical perspective on TB is probably quite a useful thing to have. If you go back to the 50s, it's probably re- uh, recognised there was maybe about 30 to 40% of herds were affected. So there's a, a huge amount more of it out there, but that's not to say that we don't have a problem now. And really in, in these islands, in Britain and Ireland, we, we continue to be sort of the, the dirty man of Europe, if you like, with the, the incidence that we have. And you're right, our herd incidence at the minute is sitting at about 10% with about 1% of animals affected. And if we want to get officially tuberculosis free, like a lot of our European neighbours have in the continent, we, we really need to radically reduce that number. And um, the, the sort of approaches that we've been using over the last 20 to 30 years have... I think it's probably recognised now that they they haven't worked. I mean, they, it's important to note that they are keeping a lid on things, and if they were not being done, things would be incredibly worse. But you're saying it's not working. It's certainly, and I think probably the department would recognise that that you know they they need a different approach, which is why they've through the years they've had different eradication partnerships put together and you know strategies. Uh, there's been two really, I think maybe over the last ten years, is a TB. Um, eradication partnership, which has now been set up most recently, and uh, is looking at ways of engaging with this and driving infection down and and trying to get us on a more sure footing. So. Let's tease through some of the mm. elements of this. Your, your profile, your job description, if you like, is that you mm. study the population genetics of badgers. Is that their family trees? What can you tell us about the yeah. badger population well, in I mean, the island? Well, the laboratory is kind of, a, a, it devotes itself both to the hosts of TB, so the animals which have it, which is typically mostly cattle and badgers, and also as well as that, we look at the genetics of the, of the bug that causes TB. It's a bacterium called Mycobacterium bovis. So we're able to use the genetic data that we get from that to tell us something about how the epidemic here of the disease is progressing. The thing that we know about TB is that it's a very complex disease. It's what we call a multi-host disease. All that means is that it's in cattle and it's uh, in wildlife and really the wildlife which poses the biggest problem. Uh, it's well recognised across pretty much Western Europe is that badgers get TB and they can spread it to cattle. So when you think uh, Let me hold you there. Mm-hmm. So badgers get TB and mm-hmm. they can spread it to cattle. Yeah. Even that is a controversial statement, isn't it? What is your yeah, expert th- opinion mm. on the transmission of TB from badgers to cattle? I think it's it should be non-controversial. I think there's been a variety of work done over the last 20 years which conclusively shows that both these hosts, both cattle and badgers, are capable of sustaining... Uh, maybe not sustaining, but certainly spreading disease among each other. So cattle to cattle transmission happens. We also know that badger to badger transmission happens. We also know cattle to badger transmission happens. And we know badger to cattle transmission happens. So there are those four routes of transmission. It's non-controversial after years of doing different types of intervention studies, whether those be culling trials or um, using sort of molecular techniques to track infection between animals. We know those four routes of transmission are happening out there. Probably the big unknown until relatively recently has been how important are each of those transmission routes on their own. And that's kind of been the holy grail, let's say, really, for 
for people working in this field. Like we, we know each of those things happens. We need to know well what's the most common because if if you were to find out what the most common route was, it would dictate probably what your policy was, and that's why people are interested in it. So what have you found out? Well, by looking at the the uh, the genetic sequence of the bug which causes TB, you know, if I can think about this in terms of what we've just learned with COVID. People are probably aware that. Um, there was an awful lot of genome sequencing of the virus which caused COVID and it told us an awful lot about things like what the basic reproduction number was, you know, this idea of R0, which if it's which is effectively the average number of of uh, subsequent infections that that an uh, initial infection causes. So one host can infect X number of extra hosts and if it's above one, the R0, then uh, an epidemic continues. And if you want to crush an epidemic and stop it, you have to get the R0 between, or sorry, below one, which is what we did by doing social distancing. So the same principle holds with TB. And we can infer an awful lot of that sort of dynamic data from the genetics of the bug. And how we do that is, as you've rightly said, is we we build family trees of the bacterium that causes TB. And if we get samples that come from both badgers and cattle that are in the same area, we can then build those family trees and can use those family trees to start inferring, you know, which of those transmission routes, the four transmission routes I mentioned, are the big ones that we need to deal with. And this has been done in lots of different places across Britain and Ireland. And in the one study area that we looked at, which is a small area of 100 kilometres square just outside Banbridge, which the department funded in as part of its, what it calls its TBR scheme, where we had active trapping of badgers and testing of them for TB. And then there was ongoing removal of cattle with TB. And we were able then to get the bug that causes TB out of all of those animals. And we can genome sequence them. And then we can build a family tree of the bugs in that area and that family tree allows us to actually look at those four transmission routes that I mentioned and figure out which of them might be the most preeminent and the thing that jumps out and this has actually been found across all areas in England and Ireland and ourselves in Northern Ireland cattle to cattle is is the big one that's where most of the transmission is happening that drives infection but we also see interspecies transmission so we're seeing transmission from cattle to badgers and we're seeing transmission from badgers to cattle now in this particular case in that area of county down the amount of transmission going from cattle to badgers was there's it's quite messy and it's quite noisy to work out but there seems to be more cattle to badger transmission than there is badger to cattle and in that sort of a, a situation there's a temptation probably you know we've TB is the ultimate political disease where people want to either absolve their industry or or their wildlife, mm. their favourite wildlife, of involvement in disease. And I would encourage people not to do that. It's it's a disease of both hosts, and you need to do something in both hosts if you want to get rid of the disease. Would that be partly to do that with the density of the cattle population? We know that yeah. herd size is increasing. Yeah, and herd size. You're absolutely right. Herd size is one of the biggest predictors of whether you're going to have a TB problem. TB, if you think about it, even from the point of view of uh, it's what we deal with in the back in the cattle side is a very close relative of what causes TB in humans. They're all part of the same family of bacteria. And if you go back to, say, only about 100 years back, it was well recognised that human tuberculosis was caused by overcrowding. And, you know, overcrowding facilitated uh, the spread of disease. Again, think of COVID. You know, it was not sensible to be in the room with people with COVID for long periods of time, unventilated rooms. So density is a big problem. Uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland have some of the highest cattle densities in Western Europe. Uh, I think some areas of Northern Ireland can reach about 150 cattle per kilometre squared, which is high if you compare to somewhere like France or Italy or Spain. We also have one of the highest badger densities uh, in Western Europe. We typically average out about four to five badgers per kilometre squared. If you go somewhere like France, you're talking maybe about one badger per kilometre squared. So we have a, a rich density of hosts that can be infected by things and that's definitely not helping. I want to come on to the, the testing regime and mm-hmm. obviously as a scientist you'll, you'll be very interesting on that but you've mentioned Ireland several mm-hmm. times in, in that conversation and mm-hmm. we have to, we are one island. Mm-hmm. How can the TB incidence 100 miles down the road sit at just over 4% mm-hmm. and we are sitting at nearly 11% in some areas 15%. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's uh, it's an interesting natural experiment, the fact that we have two jurisdictions on the island which have two different policies, because I think it can inform um, our own policy here in Northern Ireland. And certainly the Republic over the last 20 to 30 years have been very proactive in, in culling their badger population because they recognise that even though badger to cattle 
transmission can be low, uh, it can still seed infection into herds that then cattle to cattle infection spreads on and amplifies. Now, I, th- I think more recently, though, if, if you look at where they've got, as you say, to, to about 4% of their herds affected, they, they've plateaued and they're not getting any further. And I think it's certainly it's recognised now that they need to be doing more on the cattle side, that there's a residual infection left in herds and cattle uh, are, are spreading a lot of that infection. And badger culling gets you so far, but uh, you also need to be very good at dealing with it on the cattle side if you're, you're ever going to get rid of it. So it has been proposed as part of the eradication mm-hmm. strategy here that there is a limited badger cull. Do you think that is the right approach so long as it's in conjunction yeah. with a greater effort on the cattle? On the cattle, I think any sort of... You have to do something on both hosts. Now, what that something is is a policy matter, and thankfully I don't have to, I don't get to make <laughs> policy. Uh, we advise and we, we try to keep ourselves away from policy because it's, it's a political hot potato. But I, th- I think what I will say is you need to do something in hosts, in both hosts. What that something is, is difficult and it needs to thread the needle of being, you know, taking account of the science, but also taking account of what's socially acceptable and all of the things that, you know, go into politics. And I think that if you look anywhere in the world where there has been a problem with a multi-host system where wildlife and cattle are, are involved, then the only game in town is to deal with it in both hosts. And I, to the Republic's credit, they have done that. Um, but I think they're they're beginning to see even the limits of that. You can also look across to areas in the southwest of Britain where the vast majority of Britain's TB problem is. And as you're you're probably aware, and your listeners will be aware, you know, there's been a, an active um, program of, of badger culling going on. You know, live shooting of animals, which has been incredibly controversial. Yeah. And um, but yet the reports coming out of, of places like DEFRAN, our sister agency in Britain, would be suggesting that uh, bovine TB is falling in those areas. So I, w- I think the evidence is that badger culling is effective in reducing the amount of TB in cattle herds. That's non-controversial, but the issue is it gets you so far and then you're left with a residue of infection. And it's, it's doing things like potentially introducing risk-based trading that they're really interested in. So what does that mean? Well, it's, it's as simple as would you buy animals off someone who had a, D- a TB problem in the last six months? Now, this hits the buffers when you have the sort of solidarity between the farming industry, which is in many ways is a very laudable thing. But have we learned the lesson from COVID over the last while that, you know, if, if someone's had been infected within the last five days, do we really want to go calling to their door? And I think the analogy holds for TB and... Some element of risk-based trading would be a good thing, in my view, because you would stop introducing infection. Like the type of work that we do in the lab... I suppose the argument from the farming Mm. lobby would be that that would... um, That's the word I'm looking for. um, Disrupt farming practices. The the fact that there's a seasonality, that you you buy Uh stock animals in to fatten for a certain period or breeding lines, that it would be hugely disruptive, they might argue. It it would be, and... um, Megan, I've, I'm not completely divorced from this and I have I've an uncle and cousins who farm not 20 miles outside of Oma and I mentioned to, to this at, a, at a, a family gathering one time I said, if, you're, if your neighbour had TB, would you still buy from us? Of course I it would, it's not his fault and I said, well, I understand and that's very laudable but come on, if he's had it within the last six months you're going to buy animals from him and I, I just think that's the road to no time we, we, we really do see in, in the type of data that we generate the interesting thing about tuberculosis anywhere where you look across this island and indeed in Britain is that the epidemic is a series of actual micro-epidemics which are dominated by certain family, parts of the family tree. And that gives us a really insight into whenever something moves away from where it's normally associated with. And that's, that can't be caused by badgers. Badgers don't move big distances. Cattle move big distances when they're sold. And we see multiple cases of introductions of TB into new herds that have come from another part of Northern Ireland that we can trace back using the genetics of the bug and say, that's not a badger causing that. That's see, cattle moving. That's the science speaking, and I get it. I'm very mm. receptive to, to any kind of knowledge or, or information that comes to this subject. But mm. I'm curious, too, that you've got to bring farmers with you. Mm-hmm. We, we said we'd talk about testing. Mm-hmm. What is the specificity of the current test? The current test is highly specific, so it's about 98 to 99%, so it has very, very few false positives. So explain for me why Mm -hmm. some farms will test maybe, for example, 100 cows Mm -hmm. 
two animals go down Mm -hmm. and another farm, 35 animals go down. Mm -hmm. How does that work out? It can be that you can have these rare events that are kind of explosive uh, sort of transmission events whereby one animal maybe becomes what we call a super spreader. So they transmit an awful lot of infection. The dynamics on farm, the husbandry on farm can affect that. Like for instance, if you're maybe, those animals are all housed together very tightly, that aids the spread. And I mean, the other thing, like you mentioned the specificity of the test. The specificity of the test is very, very high. The sensitivity of the test is not quite as high. It could range anywhere between 60 to 80%. So let's say whenever you go on farm and you're testing, as I say, if you find a positive, the chances of it being TB is high. But this reduced sensitivity means that you actually stand a chance of actually leaving infection behind that you don't detect. And that happens quite a lot, we reckon. So there's, there's more TB out there than is being detected at any one time. And there's a kind of a tendency to kick the test at the minute and say this, this test is rubbish. And I, again, I want to kind of push back against that. Anywhere where TB has been eradicated in the world, they have used a variant of skin testing like we use here. And that's all across continental Europe, the United States, Australia and New Zealand, they're using the same type of test. But there's just something about our circumstances. We kind of refer to it and work as a perfect storm of circumstances that affects the performance of the test. And some of it's down to what you were talking about, Karen, earlier, like the density of the animals that we have, both the cattle and, and the badgers. Is our climate in some way involved? We know that uh, the TB bacillus can survive very, very well in our climate and our soils. And all of these things in the mix add to the problem, the kind of perfect storm that we have here. Is there any sense that because we test so regularly Mm -hmm. that the animals become desensitised in a way or oversensitive to certain inoculations? No, I think there's been a lot of work done on that and it's it's one of the reasons why, you know, there is um, an animal which has been tested once uh, and then if you're going to retest it, you have to leave a period of two months, Mm -hmm. 60 days before you test again because there is a recognised issue with the next test would be less sensitive but after 60 days that's not an issue that's been shown so our testing is exactly where it should be we test very very regularly every animal in Northern Ireland is tested at least once per year if we weren't doing that things would be a great deal worse again I think whilst the focus on the here and now is to say this is this is a bad thing to have reached something like 11% herd incidence that's obviously true I'm not debating that but if, as you say, if you look at the grand historical sweep of things, there was an awful lot more TB in the past. And if we, if the department weren't doing what they're doing, it would be as bad again. There's been a lot of uh, reference to COVID, and mm. I suppose it has educated all of us on, mm. on the idea of testing in a way that, sadly, we, we, we are now more up to speed. Mm-hmm. A lot of farmers will point to the distress on the animals, this repeated testing, yes. two days, three days, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Animals may be pregnant, the hassle and the, the inconvenience of putting them through, perhaps mm-hmm. abortions as well. Mm-hmm. Could the testing process not be more simple if we did a blood test, like a PCR? Yes, and there have been I mean, there've been PCR tests. Now, the, the difficulty with, with TB is it's uh, it's not like COVID in the sense that it's easy to detect. It's This is an organism which likes to hide in the immune cells of, of its host's bodies. So that makes it very, very difficult to detect, particularly about things like uh, PCR. Um, now, there, there are blood tests that are available. There's another test, an ancillary test, which up until now actually has been voluntary in Northern Ireland, but DARE are seeking to change that, called the gamma interferon test. And the gamma interferon test is um, a much uh, better sensitivity than the skin test. So in theory, it would find much more infection on farm. And indeed, if you look at certain countries, uh, New Zealand would be one of the, the cases whereby they used the skin test to find farms that were affected by TB, and then they would use the blood test to go in and really clear out the herd because it found more positives and didn't leave that residual infection. So there's all sorts of things that can be done and in, in that way. It's just everything comes down to politics and costs. So, and, you know, rolling out that scheme of extra testing to lots of other herds is expensive and, and there needs to be money found for it. So Yeah, and I've read reports that the Secretary of State's already wanting to reduce this £50 million mm-hmm. bill naturally. Um but then this would hamper perhaps future innovation, such as what we're, we're talking mm-hmm. about. What about a vaccine? Vaccines are put on, it's the BCG vaccine, it's the preferred one, which many of us as, as humans will have received. Up, I, think, I certainly did, but I think it was maybe one of the last two. Uh, BCG can be applied to cattle. It does seem to have some form of protective effect. It can also be applied to badgers. Again, it seems to have some sort of protective effect. 
Uh, the difficulty we have with vaccinating animals at the minute is that it affects the ability to trade. I mean, if you were to use a BCG vaccine in a cow, the problem is this diagnostic test that we have cannot distinguish a vaccinated animal from an infected one. Oh. So then this becomes an issue of, of trade whereby somewhere like the EU would not accept uh, that, that type of animal coming into their, their system. However, our colleagues in our sister agency in APHA, Animal Plant, Plant Health Agency over in, uh, in Surrey, have for the last few years been developing what they call a DIVA test, nice acronym. So DIVA in this case means distinguishing infected from vaccinated animals. So they've, they've developed a test which you can, in theory, and you, know, you can vaccinate an animal, but then you can use it, this very sp- a special type of diagnostic test, which then tells you, okay, whether it's a true reactor or whether it's something you vaccinated. And they're talking of rolling that out. I think one of the probably related to Brexit and not being under the same sort of EU umbrella of, of uh, regulations is that Britain probably has a little bit more flexible to do that type of thing now. And that's one of the things which they're probably going to propose doing. OK, so as we speak, we have record high figures of TB. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You seem to understand and be aware of tools that may be available in a suite of solutions. Mm-hmm. What would be the three things you would introduce <laughs> if oh, you were in charge? Question, <laughs> yeah. Three. Um, I, I don't think there is, you're right to suggest a suite. I, there is no silver bullet. I think there is this attitude that if you just cull enough wildlife, the problem goes away. And if you want to look over the border to see how that's worked out, I'm not saying it didn't help. I think it obviously has, but it gets you so far. And I need we I think we need to be better at um at doing lots of things better. If you remember I don't know if anyone's a cycling fan, but Team Sky a while back had this idea of marginal gains being maybe ten percent better at lots of little small things that then accumulates to give you the bigger benefit. And I think that's the type of approach we need to be better at. I think we need to be better at dealing with disease and wildlife, whatever that looks like, whether that involves some form of culling or vaccination. Uh, we need to be much, much better at dealing with it in cattle. I think the evidence that my laboratories produced and other laboratories around the UK and Ireland have produced is that there's an awful lot of cattle-to-cattle transmission going on, which we're not getting a grip on. I think some of the solution to that is going to be things like better bi- biosecurity on farm, maybe application of different types of tests like that blood test to find more infected animals, as well as that getting the industry on board with the idea of of being a bit more savvy in who they're trading with, like that sort of idea of risk-based trading. I mean, these are all big issues that you do not change behaviours like that overnight, but I think it needs to be a package of measures. And I, I totally get, I mean, the, the farming industry, I think people like me, you know, they'll, they'll look at us and sort of say we're sitting in our ivory towers and our and our laboratories and we don't understand. And I, I mean, I've, I've family have been affected by bovine TB. I, I, I do understand to some extent. I don't farm myself, but I, I know that... If you're a farmer and you're standing out when a vet comes back to tell you your herd is tuberculosis, it is heartbreaking for many reasons. You're shut down. You do not have the ability to trade. Uh, if you are a pedigree breeder, you could be losing whole lines of animals which you have spent thousands of pounds to put together, tens of thousands of pounds many times. And I think perhaps that's the issue that maybe people on the wildlife side of the, of the lobby and as well as that other kind of just your general citizen out there don't quite understand just the toll this can take on people and especially there are people out there who are just continually closed down with TB they have what we call a chronic problem and you think of that if that is your business and it is just continually closed the toll that that must take I think we could be better at appreciating that Is there a job of work to be done informing, educating partnering with the wildlife lobby that perhaps they understand better Mm. the need to get a lid on this problem? I think they do, to be fair, Mike. I think they recognise a lot of them. Um, you're dealing with, I think, two groups which have the absolute best motivation. They, they want what is best for their group. But in, in any of these discussions, I think you tend to have, and it's maybe a function of the way our media works, particularly with social media, is that the voices that get listened to most are probably the extremes of those groups. And as a result of that, there's a sensible middle ground which kind of doesn't speak up very much but would probably find they've more in common if they did speak. And I know there has been an attempt with like the TB Eradication Partnership to bring those groups together to to say, here's what we need to do. And if you actually look at um, the likes of the USPCA and others, they were supportive of um, targeted culling of badgers in this TVR zone. You know, so they weren't going in and just 
removing all badgers uh, in the way that has been done in England and Ireland. They were deliberately testing ones and only culling positives. And the USPCA came out in, in favour of that because they said, well, it's, you're not doing anything different than what you're doing with cattle. We can get behind that. So I don't think you could you could label them as, as you know, broad stroke anti-cull. You know, they there are sensible people there that you can have sensible discussions with. But it seems to be when we have these polarised debates, never the twain meet. And that's the curse of policy making, isn't it? The other thing which is kind of gaining prominence, I think, in the in the bovine tuberculosis debate in these islands over the last while is is the recognition that you you sometimes do have these entrenched positions on you know the the farming side and maybe the wildlife lobby side, and that there's a need for more outreach and to do effectively social science. And there's a lot of social scientists getting involved in this, bringing people together and getting past maybe. Well, I use the word with caution, but I think we're, we're all subject to some level of prejudice in how we think of other people. And you think of times you've maybe thought something of someone until you've met someone from that particular group and it can completely change your mind. And I think it's breaking down those barriers and and finding a holistic way to deal with the disease and getting a greater understanding between people is is should be the goal of, of good policy, I think, if you want to eradicate this disease. So... I suppose to an end, this podcast is a little tiny part of that. It can be. I mean, you'll. I think if, if in any sort of debate like this, if if you're getting hit from both sides and being told you weren't fair, you're probably doing it right. So hopefully that's the case. Yeah. Do you think you're getting it right? Um, I think probably from the science side, we're pretty happy with with what we've shown over the last while. It's consistent with what's been found elsewhere. It's just. I mean, as I said, it's a completely different matter to go and formulate policy. And I think, you know, in a perfect world, if you're talking to people like like me, we would always sort of say, well, you know, you should base your policy on science. But the reality is policy is, is made up of lots of different considerations. It's made up about, um, you know, what, what is socially acceptable to do in terms of, I mean, is it justified to go out and kill quite so many wild animals in this way? You know, what level of culling would be acceptable? Um, the other side of it is how much do you want to restrict the trade of the farming industry what's socially acceptable there what's politically acceptable and threading that particular needle and taking all of those things into account is what people in the department have to do and I do not envy them it is a difficult job it's somewhat easier for us to produce scientific data which says this is cut and dry that's that's our findings making something that works from that is considerably more difficult I think. but without the data they've got no informed position to form True. the policy from yeah. so that again highlights yeah. the value of the work that you do at AFBE and yeah. the need for us to get behind that research yeah. and try to enable the policy makers to take the tough decisions True and to be fair to them there are very very good at funding things and, and their their project management boards are very very good at identifying where their the holes in their knowledge are and then they will come to us and say can you address that and it's up to us to think well we think we can so, and that's the way it should be. Adrian, thank you so much for that. It's been a pleasure to meet you today and I hope we've uh, helped to educate and inform lots of people about the role that you have there within AFB. Until next time, everyone. Cheerio. <laughs>